Good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Nancy Kidd, and I am the Executive Director of the National Communication Association. On behalf of our 8,000 members, I'm pleased to welcome you to this discussion. I'd like to start by thanking the Department of Rhetoric and Communication Studies at the University of Richmond for welcoming us to this beautiful campus and for encouraging this productive and collegial partnership in pursuit of our complementary quest to understand human symbolic action across a variety of venues, including presidential politics. Given the various ways in which communication scholarship can be useful to our citizens, from interpersonal relationships to health practices to political engagement, a core component of the National Communication Association's mission is to facilitate the dissemination of disciplinary scholarship to a public audience. There are few activities more important to the welfare of our nation than informed voting, and I hope that this event serves in some modest way to provide a context for this vital practice. Once again, all of us at the National Communication Association are grateful to the Department of Rhetoric and Communication Studies for your willingness to co-sponsor this exciting event and for welcoming us to your campus. Please join me now in welcoming the Chair of the Department, Dr. Marie Bortan. Thank you very much. Um, I am Professor Amiri Bortun, the Chair of the Rhetoric and Communication Studies. And we welcome you and we um, thank the National Communication Association for collaboration and leadership on this event. A special thank goes to um, Professor Tim Barney, who will be moderating um, this event this evening. And as we know of moderators of late, he might be a Twitter celebrity by 8 p.m. <laughs> So stand in line and get your autographs early. Uh, 1992 was a significant election, and I recall fond memories of working in that election on a national focus group project with some of the panelists here, Diana Carlin and Mitchell McKinney, um, in the snows of New Hampshire. Um, and we will talk, both of them are in Missouri, and we'll talk later about how you actually pronounce Missouri. Okay, because I think that matters, and, and from Joplin, I have to say I have my predilections, and it's Missouri. Okay. Um, again, I'm going to be short here because Trevor, a former colleague of mine, told me not to have my um, my remarks long. And uh, as a former colleague, I always listen to everything he told me. Okay, and listen to other things across the the wall too in our in our building. So again. Please join me uh, in welcoming our panelists, um, panelists this evening. Well, thank you, Mary, and uh, I, I want to thank you all for coming tonight, and uh, and again, thank the National Communication Association. But I'd like to get right into it because you're probably wondering what these people are doing sitting up here, and why we have a, this wonderful group uh, being skyped in. I feel very technological right now. I'm very excited about this. Uh, so let's hope and cross our fingers that uh, that we get to keep the connection. So on October fifteenth, nineteen ninety two. President George H.W. Bush and presidential hopefuls Bill Clinton and Ross Perot took to the stage at University of Richmond's Robbins Center. As the first ever presidential debate in a town hall, hall format and the first ever presidential debate to um, have a female moderator, the innovative and memorable event brought presidential candidates in closer contact with voters, but also complicated the way American political messages get communicated. Tonight, we reflect on the legacy of one of presidential campaign history's most important and enduring debates while assessing the state of political debating and presidential town halls today, particularly as we come off the heels of one of the most divisive debates we've seen in a long time on Tuesday night between President Obama and Governor Romney. Tonight, we are fortunate to have with us leading scholars in the field of political communication to provide context and thoughtful comparison of 1992's and today's political landscape. But perhaps even more important than the impressive expertise of these panelists is to appreciate just how much the role of the citizen plays in the deliberation of major problems and solutions in public life. We have individuals joining us tonight who asked questions that changed the terms of electoral discourse by standing up 
and addressing presidential candidates directly and courageously with concern so deeply a part of their everyday lives. And we have those who sat in the audience as students uh, watching this debate who went on to a career in public service and a life of giving back to their community. Thus, while not everyone may agree, we are proceeding with the assumptions that debates do, in fact, matter. Not only do we learn information about the positions and the characters and the values of our candidates, but we also learn about who we are and how we identify as Americans. Let me briefly introduce tonight's format before I introduce our town hall participants. In the spirit, now you guys have to be with me on this, all right? In the spirit of the town hall format, the majority of our questions will be generated from the audience and some from our friends tuning in over social media. We'll, we'll see how that works, right? Uh, many inquiries will be coming from students who have been drafted. Uh, hey, hey, guys. <laughs> uh, many inquiries will be coming from students who have been drafting questions from our rhetoric and communication study seminar called Election 2012. I will begin by asking each of our participants an opening question while allowing for any additional comments that other participants would like to offer. Then, we will turn it over to you, our audience members, to be a central part of what we hope and think will be a rich conversation. Throughout the debate, we will also engage with a few of the integral moments um, through video clips of that 92 debate, as about as much has been written about this debate visually, um, as we know, as has been written about its verbal arguments. So, Without further ado, our first guest tonight is Diana B. Carlin, the Associate Vice President for Graduate Education at St. Louis University and an internationally known expert in political debating, as well as an original member of the Commission on Presidential Debates. Amongst countless other landmark publications, she co-edited the 1992 Presidential Debates and Focus book with Mitchell McKinney, uh, who you see on the end there. Next, we have the Honorable Jennifer McClellan, who is elected to the Virginia House of Delegates uh, in, from the 71st District in two, uh, 2005. As a 1994 graduate of the University of Richmond, a little Richmond pride here, guys, uh, Delegate McClellan attended the 92 presidential town hall debate as president of the College Democrats here on campus and as a guest of a certain Hillary Rodham Clinton, who you may have heard of. And she has since gone on to become an inspiring and award-winning civic leader um, right here in Virginia and in our home uh, town of Richmond. Thirdly, we welcome Mitchell McKinney way down there on the end, an associate professor and director of graduate studies in the Department of Communication at the University of Missouri or Missouri, as, uh, as I didn't get that right, uh, and a scholar who has combined outstanding and pioneering political communication scholarship with extensive experience as a staff member in the U.S. Senate and the White House and as a consultant to C-SPAN and the U.S. Commission on Presidential Debates. Next, we are pleased to present to you uh, via satellite, I've always wanted to say that, um, we have uh, Carol Simpson, we are very pleased to present her, a broadcast journalist and pioneer on a host of levels, not just as the first female moderator of a presidential debate, but now she's also a senior leader in residence at my alma mater of Emerson College. Uh, we're very pleased to bring her here with her class, which is appropriately called Road to the White House. So uh, in addition, over here, I'm, I'm trying to I'm doing both here. Uh, we have Marissa Hall Summers is also a very special guest here, right here in the middle. Uh, Marissa Hall uh, Summers is one of the selected citizens who participated in the 92 town hall debates, who asked the much debated question to the candidates, how has the national debt personally affected each of your lives, which we can all remember very well. She now lives in Maryland with her family, which they're here to join us tonight, and uh, her kids are dressed very sharply um, and, and ready to go. Um, and, uh, uh, and finally, last but not least, we finally present Denton Walthall joining us today from not too far up the road uh, and another of the town hall participants in 92 who asked the now famous question to the candidates about pledging to end negative campaigning and focus on issues instead of character, sparking a national discussion this man right here, uh, sparking a national discussion in public forums and in the media about how we as American voters judge presidential candidates. So we could spend the whole time talking about their accomplishments, but we want to get, we want to hear from them. So my job as moderator um, will, will hopefully be simple. Make sure that our audience gets heard, that's you, see that our participants get roughly equal time, uh, solicit follow-up questions if necessary, and keep the program moving. 
to paraphrase Candy Crowley here, uh, if we don't get to these questions in the audience, they'll run me out of town. So um, let us begin. So if we could, um, Trevor, if you don't mind, we want to start with a very quick clip here from the 1992 uh, Richmond debate. And um, folks up in Boston, you may not be able to see this too well, but Carol, you know this clip pretty well right Good here. Good evening and welcome to the second of three presidential debates between the major candidates for President of the United States. The candidates are the Republican nominee, President George Bush, the Independent, Ross Perot, and Governor Bill Clinton, the Democratic nominee. My name is Carol Simpson, and I will be the moderator for tonight's 90-minute debate, which is coming to you from the campus of the University of Richmond in Richmond, Virginia. Now, tonight's program is unlike any other presidential debate in history. We're making history now, and it's pretty exciting. An independent polling firm has selected an audience of 209 uncommitted voters from this area. The candidates will be asked questions by these voters on a topic of their choosing, anything they want to ask about. My job as moderator is to, you know, take care of the questioning, ask questions myself if I think there needs to be continuity and balance, and sometimes I might ask the candidates to respond to what another candidate may have said. Now, the format has been agreed to by representatives of both the Republican and Democratic campaigns. And there is no subject matter that is restricted. Excellent. So you get a sense of the, the format here that we're dealing with. And, and actually, the first question that we're going to ask is going to go to Ms. Simpson here. Uh, and at the start of the 1992 town now, hall, as we just saw... If you did that, you could take away the, the incumbent's advantage. Oh, that's right. Because... I was going to say, I heard the melodious voice of Bill Clinton there. Um, so uh, I was entranced by it. Uh, so, uh, but Ms. Simpson, at the start of the 1992 town hall, you described, as we heard here, the event as unlike any other presidential debate in history, which gave us the great title for this uh, event tonight. So can you reflect on that moment in history, um, that sense that this was a special, unique moment? Was the historical nature of the debate shared by the audience and by the candidates, in your opinion? I believe they were, Tim. Um, there had never been a town hall format, and I was thrilled with the idea that the voters could ask questions of the candidates instead of uh, panels of journalists, which had been the case uh, previously. So I thought, this is wonderful. How great that they get to ask their own questions. Um, and so I also talk to the members of the audience, the undecided voters who were going to ask the questions, and they were so excited. And we had a great chat together, and I felt totally comfortable after I got to talk to them. And uh, I had been terrified. Um, I was about to pass out right before you heard me say those words. Uh, I thought I was going to hyperventilate and fall on my face, uh, which is always the case. But once the red light came on and I was given the cue to go ahead, I knew I had to do my job and do it the best I could uh, because so many people were counting on me. Women were counting on me because I was the first woman, and African Americans were counting on me because I was the first minority. So I had this addition of um, trying to do extremely well in running this debate. One of the bad things about it was that I didn't have any tapes to go look at and see how it was done. Uh, it had never been done before, so it was kind of a show, and I got to carry it off as I saw fit. Um, and I have to say it was the pinnacle of my career. Uh, never before had I been seen by so many people the estimate of the audience then, about 92 million people. And um, I have been recognized around the world today for um, having participated in this debate. I had no idea that worldwide mm -hmm. everybody was so interested in American politics. So it's it, been, um, you know, the pitfall. 
Excellent. Well, thank you, Chair. Does anyone on on the panel want to also comment on the the sense of the uh, uh, of the significance here? Uh, on is this something, for example, that um, you know, uh, Carol uh, Carol obviously knows that the the stakes at the time, the sort of rhetorical situation that we were in was high. But do you get a sense that the the actual historical nature of this debate happened after the debate? Did this kind of take on its own life, or or does anybody have any any thoughts on that? Well. For me, it was definitely historic um, because as a 19-year-old college student, the fact that I was in a room with, with presidential candidates was historic in and of itself. But now looking back over time, I, I do think um, in retrospect, it, it started what now has become the standard. And whether it's the presidential level or gubernatorial races or even local races, it's, it's expected now. And I think if a year went by where there was no town hall uh, format debate, I think that would be the story. <laughs> well, I want to first thank you for inviting me back here. I was here in 1992. And I was up in the cheap seats, not down where they were, uh, <laughs> watching the debate. I was on the advisory board for the commission at providing uh, some research for them and also helping look at how we could improve formats. And Mary Tunn was involved in this, along with uh, her husband. Uh, they were up in New Hampshire, and we had about 20 friends in the National Communication Association who were doing focus groups. And if you remember, Carol, the first two debates were canceled that year because they were still debating over the debates. And we had this grant to do research with real live people immediately after the debates, voters, to find out how to improve the debates. And the first two debates go, I'm sitting here going, I've got all these people ready to research, so let's talk to people and say, what do you want when they finally happen? Should we have them? And one of the most common things that came out of that was that people said, why can't we ask questions? <laughs> why can't the average citizen ask questions? Because we, we know the journalists know things we don't know, but th they don't ask the same kind of questions we do. And so it was really historic in that sense that you had a public voice that was put into the debates that had never been there before and you really had no idea what was going to happen because we all knew this was going to be very different. Plus you had three candidates on stage and we had never had that before. So, so there was a lot of history being made. That's a, lot of can, that's a can of worms we're going to get to, Diana. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any, any other comments on that before we... Please. Thanks, Mitchell. You know, one of the differences that we've noticed over the years, uh, uh, I, as we were analyzing that first town hall debate, and we were looking, too, at the media coverage, and, and Dinah, you know, I've noticed this, this certainly has died down. Um, among the critics of the town hall forum uh, were other journalists uh, questioning yeah. why we only have three debates, and why should we give one over mm -hmm. to these uh, undecided citizens, and there were, there were, there's always criticism of undecided citizens of why can't they make their mind up? And, uh, but, but to yeah. the credit of these citizens throughout the last 20 years, that criticism by the journalistic community has diminished in terms of questioning should we give over one of our debates to citizens, yep. and I th and I and, and it's to me it's directly a result that the diminishing of that criticism is directly a result of the superb job that these citizens do every four years in in questioning the candidates. Good. Thank you, Mitchell. I'm I'm going to move um, to actually perfect segue, Mitchell, to the question I was about to ask, and and this one is actually specifically for uh, for Miss Summers uh, in, in the middle here. Uh, Trevor, do you mind pulling us a, the clip of the uh, well? We're, we're going to call it the famous question, the question heard around the world here uh, by Marissa Hall Summers, and uh, and we're going to take you back 20 years here. So if you can handle that, okay. Mayor Clinton, thank you. <laughs> we have a question right here. Yes, how has the national debt personally affected each of your lives? And if it hasn't, how can you honestly find a cure for the economic problems of the common people if you have no experience in what's ailing them? May I, ask, may I answer Pres that? Well, Mr. Who Paul, do you want yes, to start of with? Of course. Who? Go right ahead. Go right ahead. For each of you, yes. so it caused me to disrupt my private life and my business. 
to get involved in this activity. That's how much I care about it. And believe me, if you knew my family and if you knew the private life I have, you would agree in a minute that that's a whole lot more fun than getting involved in politics. But I, became, I have lived the American dream. I came from a very modest background. Nobody's been luckier than I've been. All the way across the spectrum, and the greatest riches of all are my wife and children. Just as to, It's true of any family. But I want all the children, I want these young people up here to be able to start with nothing but an idea like I did and build a business. But they've got to have a strong, basic economy. And if you're in debt, you're, it's like having a ball and chain around you. I'm do, I just figure as lucky as I've been, I owe it to them. And I owe it to the future generations. And on a very personal basis, I owe it to my children and grandchildren. Well, I think the national debt affects everybody. Uh, obviously, it has has a lot to do with interest rates. It has. She's saying you personally. You, on a personal basis, how has it affected you? Has it affected you personally? Well, I'm sure it has. I love my grand grandchildren. I want to think how? that. Th I want to think think that they're going to be able to afford an education. I think that that's an important part of being a parent. I, if the question, if you're, maybe I won't get it wrong. Are you suggesting that if somebody has means, that the national debt doesn't affect them? Oh, what I'm saying. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I get it. Help me with the question, and I'll well, try to answer. I've had friends that have been laid off from jobs. Yeah. I know people who cannot afford to pay the mortgage on their homes, their car payment. I have personal yeah. uh, problems with the national debt. But how has it affected you? And if you have no experience in it, how can you help us if you don't know what we're feeling? I think she means more the recession, um, the economic problems today the country faces. Excellent. And um, so here's, here's the question. And we, you know, the, the also, as many of you know, what happens uh, very shortly afterward is, is, is uh, Bill Clinton sort of steps, uh, steps out of the, the sort of the box you know, and into our personal space a little bit and, and closer to Marissa in, in the video and answers the question in, in, a, in a fairly different way. And so I guess my question for you, uh, Marissa, is, is first of all, how did you draft your now famous question about the national debt for the presidential candidates? And why was it important for you, uh, or important to you, that the candidates be able to express empathy and compassion on a subject such as the national debt? Well, during that time, uh, a lot of my friends and I were recent college grads, and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to graduate from college, I'm going to get my dream job, work a little bit, purchase a home, you know, purchase a car. Like these guys out here, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, yeah. guys. Um, and it wasn't happening. It wasn't happening. We weren't able to find work. We weren't able to buy our homes, and those of us that did have homes were having difficulty paying their mortgages and their car payments because their companies had downsized or several people that I knew had been laid off. Um, my brother, who is, is a genius as far as I'm concerned, had just gotten his MBA, and he wasn't able to find a job. Mm -hmm. And the engineering firm that I was working for, we weren't getting a lot of the projects that we were getting before. So the principals of the firm were taking pay cuts so that they could afford to pay the staff. And I began to think about, you know, I wonder if they know. You know, I wonder if they know that all of these different things are going on. And so I just started to write my question. And back then, and I don't know if people still do it now, but I had a little three by five index card and I jotted my question down. And I also wanted to represent a large sector of, of people in the United States, not just to myself. So I wanted to ask a question that would speak for um, a lot of people. And I wrote my question down, called my mother, and said I might be able to go to the debate and ask a question, read the question to her. She said, sounds good. And <laughs> <laughs> the rest, as they say, is history. It's history, yeah. No, that's a, no, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a great answer. And it gives people a, sort of a, uh, uh, an inside look into, into you know, the, the, also there's a courage to having to step up and, and actually um, ask these questions in, in, uh, in this kind of forum. Um, I had a quick follow-up, actually. This is for you, Carol, um, if you can still hear us over there. Um, I can. Uh, and uh, to go along with the, the question to Marissa, um, how did you as, as moderator um, balance the, uh, the sort of pressures to, because you knew ahead of time the questions that we were dealing with here, um, how did you balance that pressure and, and to choose which um, uh, citizens to go to and, and, uh, and, and how to manage the, uh, the citizens and to get to as many people as you could? Tim, it was totally different. I did not have 
the power to call on certain people. I did not know their questions. Yeah. Unlike Candy Crowley, <laughs> who got to see the questions and then choose the ones that would be asked, and then the order in which they'd be asked, I had no idea who was going to say what. So would you I like that power? I was talked to <laughs> by a producer in my ear who would say, go to the man in the brown suit with the yellow tie on your left. Uh, then go to the lady in the green dress. And they were literally just trying to make sure that the audience, uh, the questioners were diverse and that there were young and old and male and female. Uh, but I had no idea what the questions <laughs> were going to be. So that's a luxury now that you, uh, that they have now that you didn't have then. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's excellent. Thank you for the, for the answer on that. And now um, I'd like to also have a question here for, for Denton, if, if, uh, if possible. And, uh, and also if we could get the, the, the clip uh, prepared on that one too. At one point during the debate, I know, don't, don't hide your, your eyes, uh, an area citizen, Denton Walfell here, uh, chides the candidates for waging a negative campaign and asks them to pledge that they will only focus on issues rather than image and character. Uh, President Bush actually defends the use of character as a prime factor in a citizen's judgment of a candidate. So let's, let's um, look at this clip a little bit, and then I have a specific question for you, Denton, about, about how this went. Pain is going. We have a gentleman back here. If I may. Um, and forgive the notes here, but I'm showing on camera. Um, the focus <laughs> of my work as a domestic mediator is meeting the needs of the children that I work with by way of their parents and not the wants of their parents. And I ask the three of you, how can we, as symbolically the children of the future president, expect the two of you, the three of you, to meet our needs? The needs in housing and in, and, in, and in crime and you name it, as opposed to the wants of your political spin doctors and, and your political parties. So the, your question is? Can we focus on the issues and not the personalities and the mud? I think there is, a, a, there is a need, if we could take a poll here with the, the folks from Gallup, perhaps, I think there is a real need here to focus at this point on the needs. How do you respond? How do you gentlemen respond to... I agree with him. <laughs> Let's President do it. Bush? Let's do it. Let's talk about programs for children. Can I ask one other thing? Yeah. Could, could we cross our hearts, and it sounds silly here, but could we make a commitment? You know, we're not under oath at this point, but could you make a commitment to the, to the citizens of the United States to meet our needs? And we have many, and, and not yours. Again, I echo, you know I repeat that that it's a real need. I think that we all have. I think it depends how you define it. I mean, I I, I think in general, let's talk about these let's talk about these issues. Let's talk about the programs. But in the presidency, a lot of goes into it. Caring is goes into it. That's not particularly specific. Strength goes into it. That's not specific. Standing up against aggression. That's not specific in terms of a program. This is what a president has to do. So I, in principle, though, uh, I'll, I'll take your point and think we all... <laughs> uh, and so this is actually, uh, Mr. Walthall actually kind of started a, a trend here. You'll see this at other debates uh, where citizens will, will ask for a particular pledge here. And so I'm interested in, in this, Mr. Walthall. Can you talk about, first of all, why and how you chose this particular question, similar question to Marissa? But why do you think the invocation of a pledge uh, may have been particularly difficult for presidential candidates in a high-stakes election? They had trouble answering this question. And, and has the tenor of campaigning improved or worsened since you asked that question? Okay. Well, can you hear me? No comment. Uh, <laughs> there was no, that, that was a rambling discourse, obviously. Um, but I had a list of maybe 80 questions on the way there that had prepared um, with friends and family and co-workers and most of them were based on foreign policy issues because I was a political science major and um, but when I got here along the way on Three Chop Road there were a lot of people protesting at the time and they had their placards and they were addressing um, primary issues about jobs and employment and housing um, the budget things of that nature so that just struck me as something that was important um, the issue of character certainly was, you know, hot in the press um, with Bill Clinton and his activities, I suppose. But to me, it was, you know, we need to focus on the underlying issues and, and not the personality. And uh, in terms of how it's developed over the past 20 years, I think, you know, what comes around goes around. I think we're back to where we were in terms of what the issues are that are driving people, uh, 
you know, the buzz these days is unemployment, and it was the same 20 years ago. Um, I'm sure there are character issues that we could delve into on, on all aspects of the characters, but that's primarily how it developed. That's great. Thank you. And, and it was spontaneous. Can, oh, yes. Yeah, Carol. It's Carol. Hi, Carol. Hi, Carol. How are you? I wanted to interject here, if I may, uh, about Denton. Um, I knew that President Bush had come into this debate with his game plan to attack Clinton's character. And when he asked that question and said, we don't want the mud, we don't want the negativity, and so on, I have known George Bush. I had covered him for eight years, so I knew him pretty well. And it was as if somebody had stuck a pin in him when he asked that question. <laughs> and he was off his game for the rest of the night. I could tell that he had just lost all energy, all enthusiasm because of Denton's question. Denton, another thing you need to know is that Rush Limbaugh was on the air two days ago, and somebody sent me the link, but he uh, was talking about me. I don't know why I still gall him or <laughs> what, what would um, make you talk about it. But uh, I've been on TV a lot talking about the debates, and so anyhow, he started criticizing me, and he was talking about that Kara Simpson. Get Kara Simpson. Uh, like, that's the way I talk. And I like he that. said, I'm I going like that, to exaggerate. Yeah. He said, I don't know why she dislikes me so much. Uh, and then he said, you know her. She was the one that moderated the ponytail man's debate. <laughs> so <laughs> he remembered you with the ponytail. And I have to know, because I can't see it, whether you still have a ponytail. Yeah. Car Carol, did you just see what Denton held up? Can you see Can this? You see it? No. I'm not sure where the camera is. Yeah. You have to <laughs> Yes. <laughs> it will go with me for the rest yeah. of my days. But th and there's a story behind this. I, I, for the record, I'm not a social worker. <laughs> You're speechless, I know. Okay. Um, if I could, uh, I'd like to... Uh, I actually continue on these themes a little bit, but this is, I'm actually going to take this to Dr. Carlin. Uh, and something that, that, uh, that Denton brought up here is um, these issues of image, uh, these uh, image and issue, uh, issue issues, if you will. So how do the tensions between issues and images continue to manifest themselves in presidential debates? My poor students are probably, well, we talk about this ad nauseum in class, but these, uh, do the formats of debates lend themselves to favoring issue or image or vice versa? And what kinds of challenges does that create for candidates, voters, and campaigns? Well, Mitchell and I started doing this focus group research 20 years ago. We're still doing it. We had our first book, and, and there was a lot, there was an entire chapter that, that was written on the town hall. And uh, we've Cover, I have a second book that came out that looked at the town hall also, and, and we had one chapter in the second book that just dealt with the issue image kind of dichotomy or split. And what we've found over the years is that there's really not this split, that they really do play together. And what was happening with Denton's question wasn't so much an image issue, mm -hmm. but it was a character. And, and, and it was the personal attacks going after the character, as Carol said, they wanted to go after Clinton's character. And in two, 1996, that was Bob Dole's big push, was to go after character. Yeah. And what happened was we found out in our focus groups, both in 92 and 96, people were very offended by that. Because they were saying, don't ask questions specifically about character, don't attack, we can make decisions about character. We can make decisions about a person's image, about their leadership quality, based on what they say about the, about the issues, about how they've behaved when they've been in public office, whether they've promised to do something, and even if they didn't succeed, if they at least tried to get something through, then that says something about their character. And so they really didn't want the personal attacks, which is, I think, really what you were getting at, Denton. Yeah. And, and, but the image issue, I think, is a totally different issue. And, and that plays into the idea of leadership. And one of our colleagues who also does debate research, Ed Hink at Central Michigan, 
wrote his dissertation at Mary's alma mater and mine, the University of Kansas, on the notion that what debates do is they enact the presidency. They really are theater. And that what people see when they watch one of these debates is how someone will be presidential. How will they handle tough questions? How will they handle an unexpected question and situation? Especially with the town hall, how will they address individual citizens? And so in that sense, they feel like they get a sense of leadership, so image is important. But I think image in this election has played out on a different level. And that is more delivery style and, and nonverbals as opposed to the, the broader picture of image of how will you be president? What does it mean to be a leader? And I think that's, that's one of the changes that's happened where everybody wants to you know, identify exactly what every nonverbal moment meant because that's gonna say something about them and their reactions and their character. And I think we've maybe overanalyzed some of the image piece this time around. Yeah, no, that's good. Does anybody wanna follow up on that, Mitchell? Let, let me, I'd like to point out, particularly while Carol is with us in this question that Denton had, uh, uh, put to George Herbert Walker Bush. Um, since the first presidential town hall debate in 92, uh, we've continued in our research to analyze the questions raised by the citizens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we've done it in a way to compare those questions to the top concerns of the public during that presidential year. And Carol and, and citizens here, uh, the town hall debate that most closely aligns with, relates to the top concerns of the public, was the 1992 town hall debate. And in, in the article that I published, uh, looking at that research, and it was titled, I think, aptly, Let the People Speak, uh, it seems to be that once the moderators then were, were asked by the commission and the candidates to screen the questions, once the journalists got a hold of, okay, we will select which questions are asked, mm -hmm. rather than what happened in 92, I think a true citizen forum, town hall forum, mm -hmm. where the citizens stood one by one raising questions, raising issues, and put to the candidates, again, that was the, the town hall debate that most closely aligned with the top concerns mm -hmm. of the citizens during that election cycle. And, and, and again, uh, they got it right versus these town hall debates where somehow someone must screen the questions and select which questions get put to the candidates. Yeah. May I ask Mitchell a question? I'm curious. Absolutely to, not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> of course. No, I'm curious to know if you think that the debate Tuesday night, the questions came closer to that yeah. national public right. agenda. And I thought they did. I, yes, and we haven't, of course, included that one yet since yeah. we're only about 48 mm -hmm. hours. But uh, I do think that yeah. Candy did a very yeah. good job yeah. because you go down the line and, and there are questions that are the most, the greatest right. concern that seems to be yeah. of the citizens today. Yeah. yeah. So maybe that means we need to have women running the town hall? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Good, I, I was hoping I, you, were, you heard that yeah, one, Carol. Yeah, that was I good. knew Carol would bite on that. She and I were on a, a public radio show together a couple of weeks ago on just that issue of women yeah. moderators. So. Uh, we're going to we're gonna have to have to get to that one in, in, in a second. But one, one thing I wanted to ask here, this is uh, slightly going in a different direction, but this is actually for, for Delegate McClellan. And, and you kind of, you know, you hinted at this during one of your the answers to the follow-up question, but we have so many people in this audience that were uh, uh, part of the 92 debates here. Um, and, and now we also have students here that are uh, coming here to watch it and involved in politics now. So my question to you is, is what does the presence of a presidential debate do for the local impact, um, whether it's the campus uh, or the city? And and, um, and in other words, how did the 92 debate affect both the development and growth of the University of Richmond, but also the city of Richmond itself? Well, let me talk first how it impacted the city and the state. Um, and as you know, between 1964 and, and 2008, um, Virginia was never in play. And so we never were visited by presidential candidates. And a campaign in Virginia was sort of what you know, we as the Young Democrats or we as the Democratic Party tried to do what the Republican Party tried to do, but we weren't part of the game. If the 92 debate had not come here, the same would have been true in, in 1992. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Republicans didn't think they needed to come here and the Democrats wrote Virginia off. But the fact that you had a debate here 
we were on the national stage. Good Morning America broadcast from the University of Richmond that morning. And we made national news because, you know, the, the Clinton, and I can only speak for the Clinton campaign, but the Clinton campaign came, I think, at least two weeks before the debate. Their advance team and the young Democrats who had grown from 10 in 1991 to well over 100 in 1992 worked with the Clinton advance team doing rallies, doing, you know, whatever we could because we knew there was going to be a mock election the morning of the debate. And we, all we wanted, all we cared about was we want Bill Clinton to win that mock election because we knew if he did, it would make national news. That's exactly what happened. And, and that night, um, and, and hopefully we'll get into the story of how this sort of personally affected me and I can actually trace from that night my path to where I am today. But that night when I got to meet Bill Clinton, and the one thing he said to me was, how the hell did you orchestrate the victory in the mock election? He knew about it. <laughs> and I'd like to think part of why he yeah. performed so well that night was because of it. But had the, again, had the debate not been here, then Bill Clinton probably never would have come to Virginia. And I doubt you know, uh, President Bush might have come to Northern Virginia, but that's, that's about it. Um, I also think, and, and this is just, my gut feeling, but someone asked me the other day, why are these presidential debates always at schools that nobody's ever heard of? <laughs> and I do think that a large portion, of, you know, a large segment of the United States hadn't ever heard of the University of Richmond until that debate. Um, and so I, I do think it sort of got a lot of people, um, and I like to joke, I don't know if it's changed, but when I was here, it seemed like we were, were the Virginia campus of you know, Princeton, or we were sort of where everybody from Long Island, New Jersey, and New York went. And so I think the debate sort of opened the door to people outside of Virginia, New Jersey, and New York to say, hey, maybe I ought to look at this school. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and I want to ask one more question, and this is going to be for Mitchell, before I turn it over to our, our audience members, because I, I know everyone is, is waiting to, uh, to, uh, to ask some questions here. But it, We've talked a lot about some different issues here, and, and for you, uh, Dr. McKinney, uh, does the, I guess the bigger question is, does this all matter in the end? You hear, you know, uh, you hear this every four years about do debates matter, um, and, and why do we have them? Do they you know, make any impact or, or any effect uh, in those sort of ways? And so town hall formats in particular are often praised for creating more authentic images of candidates than, say, TV advertisements. Uh, in other words, how much of an expectation do we have that a debate can give us the real candidate? or uh, the real Bush, or the real Clinton, or the real Obama? And, and how does this standard uh, complicate our abilities to make judgments about political candidates? So I asked you about 10 questions Right, there, right. So, There's a lot so, of complicated questions yeah. there. Yep. Uh, let me, I'll, I'll touch on a, just two or three things, and then if we want to follow up in Q&A, sure. we can. Uh, first, what we have found is that there is a, a, a perception by viewers of debates uh, that town hall uh, debate results in a a, a more true uh, or authentic version of the candidates. And I think here, and, and what I found in research is that, that there's claims of, well, that they're, they're less scripted. That with the journalist and the formal, the podium debates with the journalist moderated debate, uh, they show up with their talking points, and we saw this in the first debate this year particularly, and they are more willing to uh, go off, to, to, to go to those issues that they want to talk about rather than what the question was. And in the town hall debate, what the citizens raised, and we have found, again, through content analysis of these debates, that in the town hall debate, the candidates do stick to the questions uh, more closely mm -hmm, mm -hmm. than they do in a debate that is moderated or, or is controlled uh, by a, a journalist. Now, in terms of do they matter, and you, you mentioned the effects. Let me just mention a couple of things, and then uh, th th I'm sure there's, you said we want to get to uh, questions here. We, we have found in terms of specifically debate effects research, uh, and, and I'll point to political efficacy and candidate identification. Now these are some academic terms, but political efficacy is this notion that my voice matters, that my participation in the political process matters. When we track and we measure 
pre-post watching a debate, and then we could talk about ads too. Uh, we find our greatest increases in citizens' political efficacy, that their voice matters, their participation in the political process matters, after viewing a town hall debate, much more so than viewing even other formal journalist-led debates. Now what happens with efficacy when exposed to political advertising is it tanks, <laughs> it decreases. Yeah. This notion of candidate identification, that I feel like they understand me, they care about me, that's the notion of candidate identification. Same thing as we see with political efficacy. It significantly increases when viewers are viewing a town hall debate, mm -hmm. particularly more so than other debates. Now, I think this is important in terms of our democratic process because what we also know with political efficacy is those citizens with higher, with greater political efficacy are more likely to vote. And again, the past 20 years, it, if we've hit upon a, a political communication moment that enhances these attitudes of citizens that I think can strengthen our democratic process, um, I think that's a good thing. Uh, and as I said, I believe the perception of, 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 of the of viewers of the town hall debate, whether it's the glance at one's watch, whether it's the, the, the uh, sort of aggressive walking into personal space that we saw with Al Gore in 2000, uh, uh, and, and there are other moments too in these town hall debates over the past 20 years where the viewers feel like, okay, I know this person better. I feel like I understand uh, this individual. Thank you. Any, any follow-ups on that one? Well, and I guess it's more a question. And again, I mean, I, I come at it more from just the practical as a, as a candidate and a just observer of the political system, not as a, someone that studies it. But I think it's a combination of things. In, in the non-town hall debates, you have candidates behind the podium who always kind of stay in their box. And I, th I think because the media has been covering them so long and they are much more familiar with, with the issues and the talking points, it, it's sort of a, they each know what to expect from one another. Um, and you're not interacting with an audience. And so it's a lot easier for you to be more um, studious for lack of a better word, but it's sort of, it's like a press conference. It's like I'm giving a speech, I'm sticking to my speech, I'm not getting immediate feedback, so I'm going to stick with it, and I'm behind this podium, so I'm protected. The town hall format, not only do you not know what you're going to get, but you're sitting on a stool with no podium, maybe you have notes. I, it didn't, I don't think they had, um, the other night, they didn't have the little thing beside them. So, so you really are going totally on what you remember in your head. And a person is talking to you. And so it shows the audience how you interact with people and how you respond to people. And I think as a politician, you feel I have to at least address the core of their question. Now, I might be able to veer off and go back to my talking points as I want to, but I need to do it in a way that I look and sound responsive. So let's take the, the, the question heard around the world. If you notice, <laughs> Ross Perot sort of answered the question on the debt, and I think you probably meant the economy, and Carol kind of pointed that out. I think she meant to ask how has the economy you know, affected you. Um, and Ross Perot answered that question, and, and Bill Clinton answered that question, um, because that's what they wanted to answer. They didn't get hung, hung up on exactly what she asked, but President Bush got hung up on exactly what she asked. And so he sort of went too far to say, well, let me try to answer this question, but I don't fully understand it, and in the process just looked like totally disconnected. <laughs> but if you really paid attention the other night, there were times, if you were really listening, the candidates did not answer the question that was asked, but they looked like they did. And part of it was they used the person's name, they said, oh, that's a great question, and sort of started as if they were going to answer it, but then went right back to their talking points. But because they're not behind a podium, they don't have it in front of them, and they're interacting with the questioner, it looks more like they're responding. And I think that's much more than the questions and who picks them and whether anybody screens them, 
I think that's an important piece of why the town hall meeting format um, really shows more than any other format what these men and hopefully one day women are really like and are how they're going to be as president. Excellent. All right. So what I'm going to do now, before we hand it over to the audience, I want you to do something for me, okay? And this is a little experiment, all right? But before we open mics, uh, uh, the mic to the questions from the audience, I want to see if in no more than 30 seconds, um, each one of you can share what you believe to be the most important legacy or lasting impact of the 92 debate on our contemporary political campaigns. All right, so, um, and I'm going to time you. I'm, I'm more Raditz than I am Lehrer, so, um, so I want it in 30 seconds, and uh, no one can argue for extra time on this one. So what we're looking for you to do is share with us, uh, the audience, what you believe, each of you, to believe to be the most important legacy or lasting impact of the 1992 Richmond debate. And uh, I'll take a volunteer who wants to start. Diana, take one for the team here. Okay. The fact that the public finally had an actual voice in the debates and that we had feedback from 600 people around the country who said you need to continue this and the commission has continued it so that voice has continued and now with social media with people reacting we now have citizens truly engaged in these campaigns in ways they never have been before. Wow. Perfect. Oh, it was under. It was I'll take her time. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just say ditto. <laughs> uh, even shorter. Even shorter. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, the fact that absolutely nobody knew what we were going to ask, and you can vouch for that. Nobody knew, and like Ms. Uh, Simpson said earlier, um, a lot of people were under the misconception that the producers and Ms. Simpson knew, knew what we were going to ask. And like I just said, the only person that knew my question was my mother. Mm -hmm. So the candidates could not prepare themselves to answer our questions. And I think that it showed that uh, President Bush was clearly out of touch. And though I might have not used the word recession, you know, Perot answered it first. And he got it right. So if President Bush had been paying attention, he could have done the same. Let's check in the watch, you know. Um, watch. Before we, before, Denda, if you don't mind, I'm just going to see if, uh, uh, Carol, can you, um, you want to weigh in on this here? Um, uh, on what you think that in 30 seconds, <laughs> roughly 30 seconds, what you think are the most uh, significant sort of uh, uh, legacy that this uh, debate leaves for us now? Well, I have to gr agree with the first speaker. Uh, the fact that the people are involved. This is an election by the American people, for the American people. And uh, the fact that they have gotten a chance to um, ask their own questions is terrific. But then I think about last night, which is like no debate I've ever seen before in my life. And it was to be a town hall format, but only 10 people got to ask questions. I was taking notes. And I think Candy asked more questions than the audience got to ask. So I think uh, in terms of losers, they were the real losers in uh, the debate Tuesday night. Uh, and I hope that doesn't happen again. I doubt it will, because that was just too weird. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks for your answer on that, and that kind of will take us forward. I hope we'll get some questions from the audience, too, about um, how you know, the other night's debate really, uh, does it change the notion of the town hall? Does it extend what we've done? Do we see some, a total aberration? I think um, those are some interesting things for us to tackle. But we still, I'm not, you guys are not going to get out of this, uh, uh, Denton and, uh, and Mitchell. As a participant, um, I never envisioned that I would ask a question, but I felt the power in the room with the, with the people, in essence, being in a position to confront you know, the candidates. And I guess the legacy is it, it still, still lives and still goes on. You, you know, uh, in 1997, uh, and Dinah will probably remember this, we were in South Korea uh, advising Korean election officials uh, on their first televised party leader debates. Now my legacy of our 92 debate will show some sort of egg on my face, uh, but I think it's a legacy to the world. And as I was conferring and consulting with those uh, election officials planning their debates, 
at one moment I said, and they were talking about structuring their debates, and I, and I raised our town hall format, and I said, oh, you might in your next cycle perhaps want to, to go and, and use a, 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 a format where your citizens would question your party leaders, and they looked at me like I was crazy. And they started whispering, and then one of the interpreters said to me, no, 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 uh, our citizens would not dare stand and question political leaders. Uh, we don't have that type of political culture or environment. And I was taken aback. Again, this notion of we the people, as Carol said, uh, it, it's our democracy. And, I, and then I started to think about a democracy where citizens would not be willing or would be coward to stand and question their leaders. Uh, and, and, and that sort of blew me away to think, okay, yes, so the legacy that we, again, are showing the world of, of how we run our democracy, even with its flaws, as, as Carol pointed out, that uh, as we saw two nights ago, uh, well, let the people speak, uh, I, it continues to be my plea. Your mantra, yeah. Well, um, can we just have a quick round of applause for the, uh, the panelists so far? And now, um, what I would like to do now is kind of explain how we're going to work the rest of the format here. And um, I would like for folks um, who have a question to ask, we're going to use the microphone up here. Um, so I'd like you to be able to get out of your chair and come so, so Carol and, and our friends can see you. Uh, and, uh, and you'll be right on our cameras, which is great. Um, and so um, what, I'll, what I'm going to do is I'll sort of moderate to make sure that we get to different people in the audience. But um, we're going to open it up now. And please, you can either direct your question to a particular uh, participant, or you can direct your uh, question to um, all the participants. So, who's the brave person who would like to start? <laughs> Boys. Boys, I think the microphone's on, but just check, just in case. Testing, testing. testing. Yeah. Yeah, good evening, uh, Ms. Carroll, uh, uh, panel. Uh, uh, I think the uh, first question, uh, relating back to 1992, uh, is probably for Ms. Summers and Mr. Denton. Were you ever, this is part of a meme that has been growing up for the past 20 years. Let me, let me premise this, and this has to be asked. Ms. Simpson asked, answer one part of this meme. This is the other part. Ms. Simmers, Mr. Denton, were you ever part of the Democrat Party in 1992, and were you planted by the Democrat Party? Was that question directed to me? Uh, no, that was to uh, Ms. Summers and Mr. Didden. Um, at the time, I was a registered Democrat, and no, I was not planted. I was picked by the Gallup poll as stated in, you know, in history, in the media. Mm -hmm. uh, no, not a member of any uh, political party, and same thing with Gallup. No, I was not planted by anyone. All right, now for uh, me. Tim, yeah. yes, Tim Carol. I, yeah. I would like to ask the questioner yes, uh, yes. why he would ask such a question. Uh, you may not know me, but I was there in 1992. And uh -huh. over the years, uh, I have become more conservative in my viewpoint. And on many of the radio talk shows, this tends to become a constant meme that always keeps bringing up that there were plants. You know, in the 1992 debate, and I know perfectly well there were not, but, and that also that you and the producers already knew who to ask to begin with. Uh, so this has to be laid to rest. Okay, thank you very much, because I was criticized soundly after the debate as being uh, pro-Clinton, of making George Bush look bad, and of making Clinton look good, uh, which I had nothing to do with. And it got onto the conservative talk radio circuit, and I ended up getting death threats. I don't know if people in Richmond realize that, but I had bodyguards for a week after the debate because there was such hateful um, mail and telephone calls that were generated by conservative talk show hosts. Um, so I, I'm very sensitive about it because I consider myself a fair professional journalist who only wants to do a good job on behalf of the American people. And it, it's very hurtful. 
Uh, uh, here's a jump ball question for everybody on the panel. Let's take one more, one more voice, and then we're going to move to the next one. Question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, relating to the current uh, debate cycle, what key issues do you feel are missing from these debates so far? And I'll go ahead and leave. It's starting to be addressed, and it was it was addressed the other night, but um, not quite as much as it should have. And it was only because someone asked a question. But the first two debates, counting the vice president one, in a year where we had the War of the Woman, I thought it was really <laughs> interesting that there were no, there was no discussion of women's issues, whether it's the you know equal pay or um, or the, the, the abortion issue or contraception. And given how, and maybe it's just because of the General Assembly session I lived through, but given how those issues have dominated the political discourse since January of this year, I, I found it really interesting that it wasn't until the third debate that any question related to women were asked when we're 51% of the, of the, of the electorate. Mm -hmm. And, and even then, it was only because someone asked a question, and it was only, I don't know, 10, if that. If, if that, If yeah. five yeah. minutes of the debate. Yeah. Thank you. Um, can we get another question already? And then, um, who, uh, Warren, would you like to come on up? Thank you. That's a nice tie, Warren. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this question is directed towards uh, Dr. McKinney. Um, with your experience as a consultant for the U.S. Commission of Presidential Debates, what are some of the major differences in a standard forum or a town hall forum in terms of uh, candidates preparing? Well. I would refer back to someone on the panel uh, said this earlier of of the the unexpected uh, uh, nature of the town hall and and again we heard it just a, a bit earlier of of uh, and, and I was on a radio program earlier and we were looking at historic uh, uh, clips from debates that Jim Lehrer had moderated and someone played a clip from I think it was the first 92 debate that Lair was a questioner in St. Louis, St. Louis yeah, and his water. his question th at that debate was almost identical to his first question in the debate uh, uh, that we had in the first debate here. And so the discussion was, and we, again we heard this earlier on the panel, that well it may be easier to prepare one's script, one's talking points as a candidate to uh, to to uh, prepare for these journalists, we may know what they're coming up with. Not so with these citizens. Um, so uh, there, uh, in terms of how one prepares for a town hall, I think it's interacting with citizens. And we see some candidates doing this more than others on the stump, that they're used to interacting. Uh, th th many of these concerns that are being raised are not new to them because they've been out there interacting with citizens. Whereas some candidates, this was certainly George Herbert Walker Bush in 92 and uh, uh, perhaps some with McCain uh, four years ago, other candidates may not be so familiar with these uh, public forums uh, and therefore uh, anticipating what citizens may be raising. Anybody, anybody want to follow up on that or are we? One of the things that happened in 92 was that Clinton practiced he was in Williamsburg, like, like uh, you, the delegate said. They were here two weeks ahead of time. They actually set up the set the way it was going to be set up. They even had the same kinds of chairs. They brought people in, and they had him practice. President Bush didn't do that, and Ross Perot certainly didn't because he didn't practice at all. Um, and so, so actually having somebody practicing with you who would ask the kinds of questions. But the reality is they all do practice, they have stand-ins, and whether or not they anticipate is often based on the fact, as Mitchell said, that you know what journalists are gonna ask. And I, I've interviewed two or three of the, I've interviewed Jim Lehrer, I've interviewed Hal Bruno, people who've asked questions in the past debates, and they tend to look at 
you know, polling data of what are the top issues. They look at what the media, and they often look at what the media is talking about. And so uh, Ed Rollins, who was uh, campaign manager for President Reagan, was on a panel with me at Hofstra two days ago. And he said, we knew exactly what was going to be asked. You know, we know, we know these people. We know who they are. We know the questions they ask. We know what the media is writing about. And that's happening. But you, you can prepare for that. But you really don't know what this out of the blue kind of question is going to be that really isn't out of the blue but it's what people are interested in, and it's not what the pollsters have asked about. I mean, that's the interesting thing, too, is the pollsters will list which of these issues are the most important to you. And they may not be what's on the public's radar, but you can only respond to what they're asking. It didn't seem like they, they knew that gun control was, was yeah, good. Exactly. They were prepared right. for the gun control yeah. question the yeah. other night, for example. Right, right. Would, uh, thank you, Warren. Uh, can we take another questioner here? Anybody else on the audience? Camden, come on up. May I ask a question first? Oh. Are, are these questioners uh, planted in the audience? Because <laughs> you seem to know them by their first name. Yes, they are. And are they registered I'm with the political yeah. party? Uh, yeah. I, well, you know, they actually are planted. They actually are planted. Uh, a lot of these students are here for, uh, for uh, uh, nefarious reasons. Let's just put it that way. So. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Camden. Um, my question is for Ms. Summers and Mr. Could you tell me how to pronounce your name one more time? Walthall? It's last name Walthall. Walthall. Please call me Denton. Oh, Mr. Denton. Sorry. Oh, Denton. Um, you two asked some very um, game-changing and piercing questions at the 92 debate. And I'm just very curious, if given the same opportunity uh, during this year um, at a, a similar debate where uh, your questions were not screened, what questions would the two of you ask? Ooh. Ooh. Camden. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, interestingly enough, I would probably ask my same question because it's still relevant, but I think that if they saw my face, they'd be prepared for that. <laughs> but um, now that I am married with children, what may seem like a small issue to most, and it's a big issue for me, is bullying. And um, the bullies that are in the elementary schools and junior high and high schools now are going to grow up and become adult bullies. And it's going to change, I think, the way that the world's already changing, the way that we interact with each other. But one of the things that I would ask about now is, is, is bullying. Good answer. Um, I feel like I'm being bullied. Um, I'm not really certain what question I would have on a national level. I, you know, I'm thinking in terms of what Ms. McClellan said on a local level in Virginia politics and the year of the woman or the battle of the woman, and it's, it is amazing. So I suppose to piggyback on that, it's like, you know, what what are their concerns? And you know, with Virginia and some of the the recent changes in the in the law as far as uh, abortion, you know, I guess more in terms of that, what, what is their position and, and how would they deal with it. And it seems to be flip-flopping even on that with, with both of them perhaps, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Camden. Let's take another question from the audience. Don't be shy. Uh, Tim? Oh, yes, hey, Camden. Tim? Yes. <laughs> how are you? <laughs> what are you seeing us on? We are seeing you on a portable uh, projection screen. So Is it tiny? Uh, it's not, it's, it's fairly, it's, it's, I think it's pretty big. It's pretty big. Uh, so, okay. are you trying to hide I something from us? I didn't there? know if I was a little tiny here. Oh, no, actually, no, no. <laughs> no, people, people can see you pretty well, pretty well, so. I just yeah. wanted, before uh, yeah. we uh, ended this, I oh, just yeah. wanted to introduce my class oh, that please. is yes, here yes. with me. Yeah. Um, these are Emerson graduate and upperclassmen that are taking road to the White House, and we are immersed <laughs> in the election, and I'm so glad they have this opportunity to participate <laughs> in our, uh, session here. Uh, that's the reason I'm not there with you, which I wish I could have been to see Denton and Marisa, Marissa, uh, but it's because of, of my classes here. And I just, I want to ask them yeah. if 
uh, they have gotten more interested in politics since we have taken the course. Please tell me that you have. <laughs> You're going to well, vote. I, well, I don't know if I, could, uh, if I could care more. Oh, well, you're not good. <laughs> Any class like this is already preaching to the choir of uh, people who want to be political journalists. I would say, if anything, it's, uh, it's definitely made me feel like it's a bit more important to actually pay attention to what the candidates are saying as opposed to just what they say. That's sort of what I want to hear. <laughs> That's what I want to hear. They're all going to be at my house uh, Monday night to watch the third and final debate. And we're going to have pizza and cookies and soaps. <laughs> Carol, um, do, do your, uh, your students over there, do they have any questions for our, our panelists over here? Any, anything that they wanted to, uh, any burning questions to ask our folks uh, down here in the, uh, in the South? Do you have a question? Um, you put me on the spot. <laughs> Matthew, do you have a question? You always have a question. I actually do have a question. Um, so I, do, I personally enjoy the town hall debate the most because, again, it is citizens directly asking their Democratic leaders, you know, piercing and very difficult questions. But do you, um, Carol, think that journalists should be able to screen the questions beforehand? Or should it be as the same style in nineteen ninety two, so that the candidates can prepare in any way and and directly put them on the spotlight in front of a jury of their own peers? Um I agree with you. Um uh, I, I don't think that the question is screened. Uh these are the rules that are set by the of presidential debates. The Republican and Democratic parties control the commission. And so they are the ones that set the as easy for them as possible. They don't want the unknown uh, coming up and tripping them up. Uh, but I think it should be that way we had it in 92. It's random. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Oh, it's always uh, awkward with the Skype. Um, we're having trouble getting you guys a little bit right now, so what I might do is have you kind of work that out for a second, and I'm going to take another question from our audience out here. Um, do we, uh, Mira, you have a question in the back here. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the long walk, you know. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so uh, we've been discussing this evening um, a, a new format that was established in 1992, the, the town hall debate. But I remember the debates on debates, you know, when they didn't hurt. And, and people were very creative about a various kinds of ways that they would like to witness the candidates um, instead of, uh, of doing the, the way that it had always been done. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, do any of you have other ideas, or is the town hall debate sort of like the last creative thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, or are there other kinds of formats that could do interesting stuff? Um, and you want to talk about that? I think um, we have to incorporate social media. Um, and, and you've started to see candidates and, and politicians on their own do live tweeting or, or live blogging or, um, or something similar. And or having telephonic town hall meetings, I think where you can have more than just the audience in the room ask questions and interact. Um, and I'll tell you what I'd really like to see, although I don't know, I don't know how you incorporate this into the debate itself, but as someone watching a debate, what I find is the second most innovative thing is the focus, the focus group of undecided voters with the dialer at the bottom. <laughs> I find that fascinating because what, it, what I saw the other night, um, and of course I'm a little biased towards President Obama, but so I'll just get that out there. <laughs> um, when, you know, Mitt Romney really thought he was going to score points on Libya, and that didn't move a single undecided voter. That line stayed flat the whole time. And I thought it was fascinating because he has spent so much time going back to that mm -hmm. um, in the past month. And I think if he had seen that flat line, that probably would have stopped him mid-sentence. 
in answering that question. So I don't know how you incorporate it in a debate. I think that could be too distracting for a candidate, but at least for the audience watching the debate, mm -hmm. I'd love to see every network that shows the debate do that. You, you know, <clears throat> Mary, the, the experimental ground for our debates has been in the primary season. And I've argued this, this past, and, and, and Diana, I think I'm sounding like the scholarly curmudgeon for some reason up here, but I've argued that this past primary season we saw low lights, uh, several low levels uh, debate moments where, where many of the cable networks were going to these bells and whistles of, of large video screens, of the audience involved, of the booing and hissing. Uh, the social media too, I, 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 we still, I think, need to come to some better understanding of what's happening with the social media. It may be the platform, it may be the new public forum to include public voice, but what it's brought us in this debate cycle has been Big Bird, Binder Full of Women, uh, Malarkey, Malarkey. Uh, the, 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 the moments that actually almost brought down the Twitter sphere where that's what the public was responding to. Now, uh, but I think your question is an excellent one in terms of uh, in 20 years, will the town hall forum still be the new thing? Yeah, well in fact, uh, Carol, I've been reminiscing a lot and right after the town hall debate in 92, about two or three months later in Washington, D.C., the Century Fund had, I think that's who it was, had a forum you were there, Michael Beschloss, the historian, I was on there, and, and, they, and you were talking about, you know, yours was the favorite, which it was, overwhelmingly. And we, we addressed that issue. Will the town hall get old? You know, does it need to adjust? And, and I think with technology, it does need to adjust, but I agree with Mitchell. You can, you can have so many bells and whistles that you've just detracted from it. And I do work in new democracies on debates. You know, Mitchell talked about us going to Korea, but I've been doing a lot of work in the Republic of Georgia and actually organized the first ever political debates there a couple years ago. And one of the things we've done, they've done at the Georgia Public Television is that they've gone out to the person on the street and they videotaped questions. And then they have inserted those in. I mean, these were people just walking down a street in Tbilisi, or, or they went out into the, the provinces and got questions. And so like two or three of the questions were literally coming from people who were on the streets saying, what would you ask? And that's about as spontaneous as you get. I mean, there's no reason why we can't have some way of getting someone other than those people on the stage who are representative on one level. But we've also had years, and I remember San Diego, which was the second year of the town hall, this happened, where we were out in California and there were some issues that were just really specific to Southern California. And there were a couple questions that that's what they were about. And I remember our focus group saying, I don't care about that, that's a California issue. I want national issues. So I think there's somewhere is a balance in there with what you get in and how you do it, but, but I think there is a place for, for new technology, social media. I have one, um, one bit to add to that. Sure. I think the town hall is, is an ideal uh, format. Um, one thing though that could add to it, it's, it's a hibernation of it, would be a soundproof um, room for the other candidate so they can't hear the question and they can't respond with a lot of rhetoric when, they, when yeah, their two minutes yeah. are up. Yep. Well, the other suggestion that our focus groups have made uh, is turn off the microphone. As soon as their time is up, whether it's a town hall or the regular debate, just that, can, you know, candidate finishes the sentence, the moderator yep. says your time is up, and the Come moderator down. turns the microphone yep. off. Yep. And that would be a wonderful innovation. Mir, yep. uh, did you have? Okay. Oh, I, I just I just have um, one quick follow-up because one of the things I was struck by with the debate on debates back in 1992, okay, so the two of them were canceled. We have people in our house, so we're talking <laughs> about debates, and they come up with creative ideas, and Ross Perot was running then, so we have a third candidate, and people said, you know what, remember he, he did those 30-minute 30, 30 infomercials mm -hmm. where he just did the economy and with this big pointer. You know, this big pointer and, you know, Saturday Night Live and everybody made fun of him and so on. But people loved it. They said, this is great. I wish everybody would just, like, give us 30 minutes and we could sit there on a particular topic because it makes us feel as if we're not children. 
you know, where advertising, 30 second, you know, appeals or whatever treats you like children, that they're actually sort of explaining those. So that's not even a debate, I guess, yeah. you know, we're going beyond the idea of a debate, but sort of thinking about stretching, you know, formats in certain kinds of ways. Yeah, or actually I, I visited uh, Tim's class today and also Mary's and the question came up in yours and my students have asked the same thing. Why can't they have notes? I mean, we get the fact-checking out, and there are just random fact, facts <laughs> being thrown out that are fact-checked. And so they said, you know, anybody who goes in to give a speech, they have notes, so why can't they have any? But it would be nice if they could also have some visual aids. And that came up in our groups over and over again. You know, explain exactly with these complicated, how's, here's how my tax policy is going to work. Show me, like mm -hmm. Ross Perot did, a pie chart that says yeah. this is where this much money is coming from. Then we end the bickering because they are being forced to produce some factual information that shows us. And, and like you said, then we're adults, we see it as opposed to the bickering. Well, at this point, uh, folks, I, I have to be the bearer of bad news, and um, we're going to uh, to sort of end this portion of the program. Um, I think some of our panelists are going to be able to uh, to stand by for a few minutes and, and answer some more questions. But um, I just want to conclude tonight, and and first of all, a round of applause for our participants um, and for our folks via satellite up in uh, in Boston. I, you know, frankly, part of our, our thank yous here have to be to the uh, miraculous telecom uh, and uh, and tech teams for for making this work. I'm uh, overjoyed that we were able to keep uh, Carol the whole time with us. Uh, but uh, this really has been a special program for us, and um, and we can't thank these wonderful guests enough. And um, at this time, I also want to, before we leave, thank the National Communication Association again for their collaboration and leadership on this event, um, which has really evolved since the idea started germinating last May. And and it's a testament to their commitment to promoting uh, deliberation and these sort of wild, very fascinating presidential debates. And they believe that they're fundamentally important uh, national events. And I, and I think you saw that tonight with a lot of the, the excellent um, answers that we had here from our participants and the quality of the questions that we had uh, uh, from our audience. I also want to thank the Bonner Center for Civic Engagement for their support, uh, Dean Kathleen Skerritt's office uh, in the School of Arts and Sciences uh, for, for their support, um, as well as as the folks, again, at CL, uh, CTLT uh, and student activities and, and telecom. Um, finally, I just want to take a brief moment to thank and recognize all those folks joining us tonight who helped make uh, history here back in 92. We've heard so much over the past couple months planning this event uh, from folks who have all these great stories and the immense work that, uh, that got put into uh, this presidential debate uh, that took place at, that really symbolized a big moment uh, in, our, in our history here as a campus and the determination of everyone involved at UR to put aside their uh, political preferences and uh, put on a great piece of political theater. Um, but we were fortunate tonight, tonight to reach some new insights together, um, and I want to thank you, the audience, and for not only was the 92 debate a significant event in the University of Richmond's history, it was a significant, uh, significant event in the history of political communication. So we hope to see you at the 40th anniversary. So thank you guys very much.